Good morning. Um, our first witness is, wishes to be known as Martin, does he? Sir, yes, Martin Baird. Martin. Full name. Martin Beard. And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Martin, you were diagnosed as a baby with severe haemophilia A. Yes, that's correct. Uh, that was in July 1969. Yes. Um, your mother wanted you to lead as normal a life as possible, but you did sustain a lot of bleeds and end up spending a lot of time in hospital. I did, yes. Um, uh, basically, um, I went through the normal rough and tumble of any youngster um, at that time, but uh, obviously with being a severe haemophiliac, I had a lot of bleeds. Um, and uh, where I lived, uh, the nearest hospital, well, the centre I was under was Birmingham Children's, uh, which was a 30-mile journey from where I lived. So um, every time I had a bleed, it was a trip in the ambulance to Birmingham Children's. And the available treatment at that time in your early childhood was cryoprecipitate, but you had an allergic reaction to I it. I did. I used to have anaphylactic shocks, um, anaphylactic reactions to cryo. So um, in about 1974, you and your mother were told that there was a, a new treatment that was going to be made available for you, factor eight yes. concentrates. Uh, and if we look um, on screen, please, at a document... Paul, it's 0012003. It should come up on the screen in front of you in a moment. We can see this is a letter dated the 16th of December 1974 um, from the Lister Institute for Preventive Medicine to the Birmingham Children's Hospital. And it says that in relation to you, we can let you have some bottles of a globulin concentrate to control his bleeds. Now he's become sensitised to cryoprecipitate. Uh, and then there's a reference in the next paragraph, we've recently encountered some difficulty with positive RIA hepatitis B antigen tests. I suspect that some, possibly most of these are false positives. The only concentrate we can send you is from a batch number HJ1025, which has given such a positive reaction, which was diluted out. Dr. Fluitt knows of this problem and would probably retest this batch for you. Do, do you have any observations to make about that letter? Um... Apart from the fact that uh, they clearly identified a potential problem with it, but they were still prepared to um, distribute it, um, which uh, <laughs> it's still shocking, but um, given the uh, time and back then in 74 and the fact that this Britain was very uh, struggling to be self-sufficient in fact, uh, um, but it, it still shouldn't have happened. Now, you... Um, received the factor eight concentrates initially at hospital rather than at home. Yes. Uh, um, and then in 1975, you had a particularly dangerous bleed. Uh, you had a lot of blood from a head wound. Is that right? Yes. Um, it was a, a, an innocuous injury. Me and my uh, middle brother were um, having a snowball fight, and uh, he threw one at me, and it had got a little stone in the snowball which cut me on the top of the crown of the head a very tiny cut and um, we were outside a social club at the time where my parents were inside and um, I went in and there was blood running down my face and uh, my mother jumped up and screamed I can still see it to this day but she took me home cleaned me up put a bandage on my head um, and because it was such a small cut, it didn't really think it needed any treatment. Um, but what happened was it kind of built up and in the night the bandage came off. And the following morning, um, my brother described it as what he thought was like a murder scene. There was blood everywhere. Um, and he went downstairs and said to my mum, I think Martin's dead. But because he was a practical joker, my mother didn't believe him. Luckily for me, my eldest brother, he came down. He was the more sensible one at the time. And uh, 
He said, it's true, I think he's gone. Um, and they rushed me in an ambulance to Birmingham Children's. I remember passing out in the ambulance, looking up through the frosted ceiling. And then I came round in a, a room in the hospital, looking up at a nurse who was clearly cutting my hair away, trying to find the wound. And then I passed out again and came round in a hospital bed. Um, but they had to replace me with a few uh, units of blood. Now, it was in 1976, the following year, when the hospital started to train your mum on administering the Factor Eight products to you at home. Yes. Um, her training basically involved... Um, she had to try and inject the veins in an orange. That was how she was trained. Um, and it was quite bizarre as a seven-year-old to watch my mum do this. Um, but that was how she was trained. And then, uh, But then we had to get permission from my local GP to be able to take Factor 8 home with me. And initially, my GP refused. So we changed GPs. Um, and uh, the GP I went with was brilliant. He was a superb guy who um, I was under for the next 40 years. And do you know why the first GP had refused? He basically said that um, if he uh, couldn't um, inject me, then uh, there's no way my mum should be allowed to. Now, after you'd changed GPs and arrangements had been made for the home treatment, your mum would then store the Factor 8 in a fridge at home and would yep. treat you at home? Yes. And, and your mum kept meticulous handwritten records from 1977 onwards of every time you had a bleed that required her to administer yes. factor eight to you yeah um she she never really trusted doctors um and although the hospital had their own records which was basically a sheet of paper written down with what the bleed was for and how many bottles of factor that you would have my mum actually kept her own records and she wrote down the site of the bleed and uh, when it was and, and roughly how many bottles you would have for that bleed. And it, it's clear from those records which you've, you've shown to the inquiry that you were having bleeds at least once a week, often twice a week, yes. week in, week out for years. Yes. And, and you required factor concentrates as the treatment for that. Yes. Uh, and you've also got some UK HCDO records uh, which show that from 1977 onwards you received a range of different products, cryobulin, factor eight BPL, cutter factor eight, profilating factor eight. Yes. Now, as far as you're aware, was your mother ever given any advice or information or warnings about any risks of infection associated with the use of those products? No. And as you grow into, grew into a, a teenager... Uh, and continued to take those products, were you ever given any advice or warning or information? No. It, could we have up on screen, please, Paul, 0012004? And if we could just have a close-up on the first part of it, thank you. So this is a document from 1981, shows a range of tests, and, and you had some observations you wanted to make about this document. Yes, um, I, ba I was watching uh, another testimony and um, during the testimony this uh, document flashed up and I thought to myself, I thought, I've seen that before. And I went looking through my notes and I found this document and it's exactly the same document as another person was tested for in the same year um, the, the, the only differences were uh, the other person was about eight years younger than me and my test was done, I think, six months before his. And it just seems very strange that we were both tested in the same year for such a bizarre range of tests. And you've said in your statement you think that tests were undertaken without y your, oh, yes. you and your mother's knowledge and consent. Yep. You'd have been about 12 at this time. Yeah. Um, as far as you're aware, was your knowledge, was your consent, your mother's consent, sought for this, these kind of tests? No. no. Now, in 1986, your care transferred from Birmingham Children's Hospital to the Staffordshire North Infirmary. Yes. Um, uh, basically, I was too old to be classed uh, 
under the children's hospital anymore. Um, and I thought that I would um, transfer to the Queen Elizabeth, as most of the haemophiliacs under Birmingham Children's did. Um, and we were like a community. We, uh, I knew a lot of the haemophiliacs at Birmingham Children's. Um, and that's what I assumed would happen. But then um, Frank Hill said to me one day, he says, I'm going to transfer you to North Staffordshire Royal Infirmary because I think it'll be more convenient for you. Um, it turns out it wasn't. It was a longer journey. And uh, it, it was also apparent that he had a friend there. Um, so I got an appointment uh, 1st of September 1986 at North Staffordshire Royal Infirmary. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't driving at that point, and my mother, so she was only just learning to drive again. So we went in a, an ambulance car for this appointment, and um, we're in the waiting room, unlike any other, and uh, my name is called out, and my mum is on my arm because she's struggling to walk. And we open the doctor's door, and I'm not even in his office. We're stood in the doorway, you know, and he doesn't even say, please take a seat. Hello, welcome to North Staffordshire. Hello, I'm Dr. Ibbotson. He doesn't say anything. All he says is, hello, I see you're HIV positive. And whether I may be naive or the fact that I was a very healthy 17-year-old, I just batted it away and I said oh well that's life because I didn't really understand the full implications of it and he looks at me and goes well that's your life for the next two years and I said what do you mean by that and he says well you've got about two years to live that's when it hit me um, and I can't really remember the rest of the conversation I had with that man that day uh, I just remember going home and having to break the news to my brothers um, but I don't know what their reaction was, whether they went away and cried, I honestly don't know. And that's how you learnt that you had been infected with HIV yep. in consequence of the treatment you'd received. You, um, you've said in, in your witness statement you were in a, a state of shock and disbelief. Um, one of the particular concerns you have looking back your recollection of that consultation is that this information was delivered to you in a way that others in the waiting room could hear yes yes he didn't whisper it he said it in a normal voice and there was the door was open and the the normal public were sat in the waiting room behind me now that was as you've said the 1st of september 1986 uh, we're going to look at a, a couple of documents now. Could we have up on screen, please, Paul, 0012005. And if we could again have that highlighted. So we can see this is uh, in relation to you. Um, we see down the bottom it says date of specimen 1983. Date of report, it's undated. The test result is HTLV3 antibody positive. But we can establish some kind of time frame for this by your age, which is given at the top as 14. Yes. So in what year did you turn 14? Uh, that would have been 1983. January the 10th, 1983. I would have been 14. So this is a result showing that you were HTLV3 positive, um, uh, that you think is most likely a result from 1983 because yes. of the age that's given there. Yes. And you weren't told of that test result? No. Were you told that you were being tested? No. If we can have a second letter up on, a second document up on the screen, please. It's 0012002. Now we can see, Martin, this is a letter from the Leicester Royal Infirmary. Dated the 11th of October 1985, it's addressed to a Dr. Perry, Senior Registrar on Haematology at Birmingham Children's Hospital. So this is almost a year before you had the consultation you've described in which you learnt you were HIV yeah. positive. And we'll just look at this letter together. Dear Dr. Perry, re Martin Beard, thank you, for the your, thank you for letter to Dr. Hutchinson, which he passed on to me. 
We did ask Martin and his mother to call in and see us, but apparently they got lost in the hospital and didn't make it to the haemophilia centre. However, he did turn up this morning when I was holding a haemostasis clinic and I met him then. Next paragraph refers, Martin, to you being in Leicester for a couple of months learning electronic assembly work at the skills centre and refers to home treatment and to a bleed into your knee and explains that the sister, that's the nurse at the work centre, yes. insisted on him coming to see <coughs> on you coming to see them. Uh, there's then a reference to your um, health in the following paragraph. And then if we can have the next paragraph, please, highlighted, the one after that, Paul. It says this. We note that he is HTLV3 antibody positive, but is not aware of this, and that you do not wish this to be divulged to him. We shall make every effort to comply with your wishes. So that's a letter, October 1985, which may have been, in any event, a couple of years after <clears throat> you'd been, the, yep. the test had been undertaken. One doctor to another, referring to your positive test result, to the fact that you're not aware of it, and that the doctor at the Birmingham Children's Hospital doesn't want you to be told. Yes. Now, when did you first see this letter? I saw that in 2006, when I got hold of my medical records. And what was your reaction to seeing that letter? Stunned. Absolutely stunned. Um, total blatant disregard um, for me and disappointment, the fact that I had been under... Ox, uh, under Birmingham all those years um, and while I was under Birmingham I was always very open to medical examinations um, because I was blind in one eye and they liked examining me and I was always open to questions and things like this but they never had the decency to tell me about this um, and what also staggered me was the fact that they were prepared to put other people at risk the people who I was working with. In terms of the work you, you, that, that's described there, the work that you were doing in Leicester, was that very physical work? Some of it was. Um, some of it I was doing sheet metal working, riveting working, um, and then I, I moved on to the electronic assembly work, which was less demanding. But um, when I was doing the sheet metal working and things like that, they were they, for a severe haemophiliac, it was very dangerous work. Um, and... If I'd have had a bad incident, people would have been at risk. And that is just staggering. And in this period, 1983 to 1986, before you discovered um, uh, your infection, uh, did your mother continue to administer the factor eight to you at home, or were you doing this by yourself? By I was doing that by myself. I, um, uh, I started treating myself at the age of um, 11, I think. Um, basically, I was a, an inpatient at Birmingham uh, one day, and the haemophilia nurse um, came along and she said, you're going to inject yourself today. And I said, no, I'm not. And she said, you've got two choices. You either put the needle in yourself or you stick it in me. And I was that petrified at the thought of putting a needle in somebody. I just grabbed it and did it, and that was my initiation or training over so from then on I, tra I treated myself and Dr Perry and Dr Mitchell so the person to whom that letter was addressed and the author of that letter have both been asked for their response uh, and uh, I know you've seen those responses Martin Dr Perry simply says I cannot comment upon the screening for HTLV3 antibodies I was, during this period, a trainee under the supervision of Dr. Frank Hill, consultant haematologist, and whom I would advise is contact contacted to discuss this in detail. D do you have any observations to make about Dr. Perry's response? Um, <laughs> one way or another, um, they know more than they're letting on. They, they were either ordered from higher up to keep it a secret or they made the decision on their own I, I can't see any other way around it and Dr Mitchell but before you go on to Dr Mitchell uh, what you've dealt with 
thus far is his reaction to the screening. Does he say anything uh, about what is said in the letter about him not wanting to tell uh, Mr Beard what he knew about his HIV status? Sir, no. Um, I have read out verbatim the one paragraph of Dr Perry's statement which addresses the substance... So he simply doesn't engage with the criticism at all? The, the uh, inquiry team are going back to Dr Perry to ask for further responses. It might be useful when you do to confirm what date he knew uh, there had been a an actual positive test for HIV. Because 1983 uh, was before HDLV was identified. But that wasn't till, as I understand it, uh, till May 1984. Yes, sir. So the, the test results you've shown us must, must be a, a retrospective test. But it's plain from the letter that they knew um, by the date of the letter. Yes, sir. It, it's not clear, as, as, um, as, as Martin knows, from that test result, because, because the report itself is not dated. Unusually, most of the reports in Martin's medical records are dated. That one is not. Um, Martin, you've also been shown Dr Mitchell's response. Dr Mitchell was the author of that letter, saying that they do their best to comply with Dr Perry's wishes not to divulge your HIV status to you. What Dr Mitchell has said is... It's unbelievable that the doctors at Birmingham Children's Haemophilia Centre intended that Mr Beard should be kept permanently in ignorance of his HTLV3 antibody result, a position which would be untenable. And Dr Mitchell goes on to say that what was being asked was that you shouldn't be told the result um, uh, by a doctor who you never met before and would never see again. Mm. Do, do you have any observations to make about that suggestion? Um. The doctor at Leicester was put in a difficult position. He was asked to keep something a secret. Um, morally and ethically, maybe he had a duty uh, to inform me or at least inform the um, nurse at the training centre. But to my knowledge, she, even she was unaware. Um, they obviously had their reasons for keeping it a secret from me. Um, I will probably never know what they are, but uh, the fact that they wanted it a secret, full stop, is a blatant disregard for other people's health. There's one further document um, we'll look at, Martin. It's 00120006. And so we can see this is a result... Um, it's stamped 1st of May 1986, and again it records a positive uh, test result for the antibody to HTLV3. That's May 1986. Uh, were you aware that tests were being undertaken in May 1986? No. And this test result was not communicated to you either? No. Because the first you learnt the was... The first I learnt was September, September that year. Now... In early December 1987, the following year, you were admitted to North Staffs Royal Infirmary with a knee bleed. Yes. What can you recall about the circumstances of your treatment there? Um, well, whenever I'd been admitted into Birmingham with a knee bleed, the, the normal procedure was um, I would be put on bed rest, I would be given factor, the bleeding would be under control, and then they would resume physio to get my joint mobile again. Um, when I was admitted into North Staffs, uh, the first thing they did was put my leg in plaster. Um, and then they put me in a side ward and effectively left me. Um, when they brought my Factor 8 in to me, the staff were in full medical gear. Masks, gloves gowns, the whole lot. But the factor eight wasn't even made up. I had to make it all up myself and inject myself. They even bought my dinner in, in full gear. Um, the isolation was just so draconian, it was ridiculous. Um, and I was, I was scared. Um, I'd been told by this hospital that I'd only got two years to live and then all of a sudden I'm being treated like this leper. And uh, 
I unfortunately back then I was a very quiet person and I didn't really speak up. Um, thankfully for me, uh, behind the scenes, my mother was um, having a word with the doctor and basically begging him to let me out for Christmas that year. And he said to her, he says, yes, you can go in for Christmas as long as you bring him back. And uh, kind of discharged me on the 24th of December. But I never went back there. And you've explained in your statement that was your first sign of any real stigma and isolation from medical practitioners yes. in regard to your HIV status. And um, your, your mother was incensed and wrote to the Haemophilia Society about it. Yes. Uh, and we can see the response at 0012009. Uh, and if we just have the uh, second paragraph, I can only say from our point of view in the vast majority of haemophilia centres, the action taken by the hospital is absurd and ridiculous. Uh, uh, and uh, goes on to talk about the irrational and overreactive way in which you were handled. Yes. Now, you didn't return to the care of North Staffordshire Royal Infirmary no. for the reasons you've explained, and, and you next came under the care then of... Derby, Derby Royal Infirmary in April 1988. Um, I was effectively without a hospital for four months. Um, in them four months, I just basically went under the care of my local hospital, which doesn't deal with haemophiliacs, and... Um, I, I, I can't remember which hospital I got my factor concentrate from for that four-month period. It might have been North Staffs, it might have been Derby. I can't honestly remember. Um, but in April 1988, I, uh, I, I gave in and became a patient under Derby Royal Infirmary, which I had always been reluctant to do because it wasn't a proper... A comprehensive haemophilia centre and also um, growing up I'd seen my and my cousin who were all haemophiliacs treated there and I'd watched grown up watching them in calipers and with bad legs and things and I and I thought it was the care of the hospital that had made them that way it, it turns out it obviously it's just a progression thing with haemophilia but that's how I was feeling at the time and your diagnosis and the fact that you'd been led to understand that you only had a couple of years to live led to you making a will at that time at the age of 17. Yes, yes, and it's still to date the only will I've ever made. I do mean to update it, but part of me thinks, well, if I do that, it's almost like an admission that I am getting on in life. <laughs> In those early years after your diagnosis was finally communicated to you, what was the impact on you of your condition, both physically and mentally? Um, sorry, could you repeat that? In, in the early years after you were told in, <coughs> in September 1986 of your diagnosis, what was the impact physically and mentally? Um, well, we, we, we started receiving some information. I can't remember who from. We got leaflets through the post of... Um, advice uh, we, we were ad I was advised to only eat tinned food I was advised not to keep any pets um, and I'd had dogs and cats my whole life and uh, I was toying with the idea of getting rid of my pets and I thought the psychological benefits of having pets far outweighs any potential risk in my book um, those Pets had been with me throughout my childhood. Whenever I'd had bleeds, whenever I was in pain, they always kept me. They were always there as comfort, so they weren't going. Um, but I find myself uh, eating things that I wouldn't normally eat, you know, simply because of this advice. Um, and there, I was told to only eat, uh, uh, to only drink um, uh, bottled water and things like this. Um, but the town Burton on Trent, where I lived. Um, we had some of the best water in the town because it was a brewing capital and um, I'd been drinking tap water my whole life I'd never had any issues um, so it started affecting you mentally and how you behave um, and uh, I was a very very skinny person at that time and uh, I, people did actually say to me at times uh, have you got AIDS and this kind of thing and I'd say why would you say that so well you're so thin and so, well, I was a very athletic person. Um, 
you know, but uh, when you when you live in a small town like that, um, it, it's difficult keeping those kind of things a secret. You you can uh, go within yourself and um, hide away to try and keep these secrets, or you can be open about it, um, which unfortunately does can put you up for um, to be shot at. But uh, um, I just try to live my life day by day and um, just te- see where the future took me. In 1992, your haemophilia care transferred to the Oxford Haemophilia Centre, but for the time being, your HIV care remained at Derby. Yes. Um, that basically happened because um, I was a uh, impatient at Derby with a bad knee, the same bad knee that I'd had problems with for a number of years, and they wanted to give me a knee replacement. Um, but I was only 22, and I thought, I'm, t- I'm too young, surely. So we asked for a second opinion, to, opinion in, from Oxford because my, one of my uncles, who was a haemophiliac, passed away in Oxford in 76. Um, and uh, they always they said to the family, they said, if any member of your family has a problem in the future, you can always come to us for advice. So my mother wrote to um, Charles Rizza at Oxford explaining who she was. And um, he said, well, we'll see Martin. It's not a problem. So I went down there. I think it was Jan- about January the 2nd, 92, something like that. And... Um, I met Paul Giagrandi and Charles Rizza, and um, they bought out my uncle's notes from 1976 with deceased written across them, which was quite freaky. But they said to me, they said, we keep all families' notes because there may be some kind of genetic link further down the line. Um, and he said straight away, he said, well, first of all, you're too young for a knee replacement. He said, um, there's plenty of other options. Um, you could have a knee washout. He says, uh, I see that you're still under the care of Derby. He says, we will ask Derby if they are prepared to pay for this. If they're not, we'll go ahead and do it anyway. Um, and that's what they did, and Derby did pay for it. And I had the washout in June, I think, 92. Um, and I became a haemophilia patient under Oxford. But I was still going back to Derby every quarter for blood tests for the HIV. And a couple of years after that, in 1994, at Derby, it was suggested to you that you should start on AZT treatment. Yes. um, It was early 94. It might have been about March, something like that. Um, I went to the HIV clinic, as it was then. As I say, it was really just a case of routine bloods. And the two doctors... um, Mitchell and Main um, handed me a bottle, bottle of pills and I said, what is this? And they said, well, it's AZT. Um, I said, why are you giving me this? And they said, well, we think you'll benefit from them. And I thought, I feel fine. I feel healthy. I, it just didn't feel right. Anyway, I took the pills home with me and I mentioned them to my mother. And because I'd already got this link to Oxford... I thought, well, I'm going to ask for some advice. So I phoned the Haemophilia Centre at Oxford and they put me in touch with the HIV clinic there and uh, uh, Chris Conlon. And he said, well, I notice that you're already come down here for your haemophilia. Um, if you like, you can come down here and we'll give you a review. So I did. And he said, well, first of all, he says, we don't give our patients anything unless they need it. He says... Um, And I notice here that you've been exposed to hepatitis C. Um, Have you been vaccinated against hep A and B? And this was the first I ever knew about any of the hepatitises. Um, And I said, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And he said, right. He says, well, we're going to ask, we'll ask Derby if they've vaccinated you against A and B. And uh, he asked Derby, and Derby said they wouldn't do it because it was too expensive. Um, and he says, I can see you've, still, you've been exposed to hep C, which fortunately I spontaneously cleared it. And um, 
he gave me the opportunity to become a fully fledged Oxford patient, which I took. Uh, and uh, you didn't take. I didn't take AZT. AZT. No. You had a cousin. Yes. Who'd also been infected in the same way as you, who'd embarked upon AZT at that time. Yes. And uh, who died some months later. He, yes, he started taking AZT. Um, I think it was the same day that I'd been to the clinic and I refused it. He was offered it and he took it and he was dead in July that year. And one of the observations you've made in your statement is at your cousin's funeral, you recall family members looking at you and your sense was that they were thinking, how long has Martin got? Yeah, I remember going to see him in the hospital about two hours before he passed away. And I was there with his brother and... Um, we walked out and he said to me, is that normal? And I said, I've got to be honest. I'm, I, I, he was the first person I'd seen die from it. Um, I, I've, I've seen people die in front of me. I've, I've had a couple of friends die of heart attacks right in front of my eyes. 129, 155, died just like that. But I'd never seen anybody suffering like that. And that scared me. Um, and then at his funeral, I thought, my God, is that what's going to happen to me? Um, and I felt all these eyes looking at me, you know. They probably weren't, but that's how paranoid I was. Now, by 1997, you were starting to be physically unwell in consequence of the HIV infection. You put yeah. it this way in your statement, HIV was starting to get a grip on me. Yes. Um, I'd been in a relationship and... Um, uh, I always knew that the person I was with would want her own children one day because she was adopted. Um, children, having children has never been a massive issue for me. And even before HIV came along, it was um, a moral dilemma whether I wanted to carry on the haemophilia gene or not. Um, so I took the decision for us to end, to, for us to split um, the end of 1996 so that she could go off and have children. And thankfully she did, and she's happy. Um, but I went downhill uh, to the point where I effectively wanted to die. Um, I, was, I was as low as you could get. Um, and then in January 97, um, I started getting all kinds of internal infections. And... Whether it was self-preservation kicked in, I don't know. But I, I drove myself down to Oxford and I checked myself in to the uh, John Waring Infectious Diseases Clinic at Oxford. And Chris Conlon came to see me and he started treating me for the uh, various infections. And he said to me, he said, your CD4 count is down to 70 at the moment. Um, and... I think it's time we started thinking about putting you on some kind of a drug regime. Which, uh, for me, taking pills is something I've always been against, but needs must. And uh, he put me on a double therapy of um, didanazine and AZT. And when he said to me he was putting me on to AZT, I had a wry smile on my face because I thought, the difference is, I trust this guy. I didn't trust the ones at Derby. And you were on that combination of drugs for two years till yes. early 1999, during which you're, you regained <clears throat> some of the weight that yep. you've lost and your CD count did go up. Yes. And then since that time, you've gone through a range of different drugs. Yeah. Uh, in 1998, the medication that you started, Crixivam. Yes. Had a lot of side effects. Yep. What, what were they? Um, the main side effect of indinavir or crixivan, as it's known, is um, a condition called lipodystrophy. And basically what it does is it takes the fat off your arms and legs and your backside and it moves it around your body. And it puts it in places where you don't really want it. In your stomach, around your internal organs, and in my case, on the back of my neck. You end up with a lot what is known as a buffalo hump. Um, I've also had ingrowing toenails, and uh, I also the prob one of the biggest problems with uh, indinavir was you were supposed to drink plenty of fluid, 
And um, during the summer of 98, I went traveling America. And uh, basically, I didn't drink enough while I was out there. And uh, I came back and I started with kidney crystals. So I had to be flushed out for them as well. And that was a very painful condition. It was, whilst, yes. Whilst it lasted. You then changed uh, uh, to Viracept? Uh, yes. Um, I, th- I think I went on to probably Nelfinavir before that. You, tried, you went through a trial, which you described as an Esprit Yes, in, two, trial? in 2001. Um, it was a trial called uh, the Esprit trial, interleukin. And this basically came about in 2001 when I was in having my ingrowing toenail sorted. Um, a professor came to see me at the John Ratcliffe, sorry, at the Churchill Hospital in Oxford. And he said, uh, we're doing this trial called the interleukin trial for people with a CD4 count of 300 or more. And at the time, mine was 450. And uh, I said, OK, what does it involve? He said, well, it involves two subcutaneous injections a day for five days. And it's to basically stimulate your immune system. Um, we don't know what your base CD4 count is because we don't know what it was at the point of transmission. Um, but uh, if we can get it up as high as possible, the better. But he says there is a, a, quite a few side effects with this interleukin. And I thought, well, I, I'm prepared to try it. I'm already infected. I've got nothing to lose. Um, so I took this interleukin home and... Uh, after three days, I was practically bed-bound. Um, I'd put on nine pounds in weight. Um, I was aching, uh, feverish, all kinds of symptoms, uh, diarrhoea. And then on the final day, I tried to have a bowl of soup, and I was just projectile vomit everywhere, and I lost all nine pounds in one go. And the doctor phoned me up to see how I was doing at the end of the week, and I told him about the side effects. And he said, right, he says, well, give yourself a week to recover and then come down and we'll take some bloods. Um, I went down, he took some bloods and my CD4 count had gone up to about 1,300. Um, And I felt like Superman at that time. Bugs were just bouncing off me. Um, But over the next six months, my CD4 count dropped. And um, I think they estimated my base level was probably around about 700. Uh and after the conclusion of that trial, you went on to uh, Viracept, and then in 2014 to Trivada, yes. and then in 2017 you switched into a, your current regime, Trimet. which is 3001, yeah. and that has had not, not had any particularly... No, no. Um, the, uh, I was at the hospital yesterday, and they were asking me how I was doing with that, and Trimec... I don't seem to have any issues with that. Uh, One of the main reasons that they put me onto Trimec, because of all the other protease inhibitors before that, had caused this lipodystrophy, and and basically they were hoping... They they said it's irreversible, but they can probably stop it getting worse, and it does seem to have worked, because quite a few people look at me and said, you look like you've lost weight, which (laughs) I don't think I have, but if they they think so, then fine. (laughs) Now, you've told us already about the experience you had being treated late 87 at the North Staffs Royal Infirmary. What impact, if any, has your HIV status had on your dental care? Um, I did have one bad um, episode with a local dentist some years ago. Um, I'd got bad toothache and I went to see him. And he took x-rays and said, yeah, there's no problem with your teeth. And I went home and it got that bad that I contacted Oxford and they put me in touch with their haemophilia dentist and I went down there and they examined me and said how has this been missed you've got four wisdom teeth coming through and I was admitted into the John Ratcliffe where under general they had to break my jaw and get the wisdom teeth out Um, and I do believe that that dentist was just scared he didn't want to treat me Um, thankfully he's the only dentist I have witnessed that from but I have heard that it is quite a lot more commonplace. Martin, can I ask you about how your infection, the treatments you've received for over the years, have impacted on your family and your private life? Um, my brothers, thankfully, they've, they've got no health problems. Um, I'm probably... 
I'm probably built to withstand these kind of things. I can deal with them. Um, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Uh, but I've seen the look of anguish on their faces at times. I remember one incident I was being I'd taken to hospital some years ago, and I remember seeing out the back doors of the ambulance my oldest brother running down the street after the ambulance. Um, they don't talk about it to me. Uh, I, I, I think they... They can't even use the word HIV. You know, my eldest brother refers it to it as the lurgy. Um, whether they talk to their friends, I don't know. Um, but they they do struggle. Um, I've I learned from a very young age uh, to use a bit of reverse psychology um, on people because. I was born blind in one eye, and I had a very bad squint in my left eye, so I used to get the mickey taken out of me from a very young age. And I used to turn this around and take the mickey out of myself, give these people no room for manoeuvre. So I've always been able to deal with it, and um, I've got a bit of a wicked sense of humour in that fact. But uh, um, the, the years between 87 and... 2000 really were dark years for me um and i started playing pool um and this was a it was almost a it was an emotional crutch as well but it also helped me build my self-confidence because i was good i was good at it um but that didn't always go that smoothly i had problems um with prejudice from people in that area. But I also um, gathered a lot of good friends. We've got a newspaper article you've shared with the inquiry, 0012008. AIDS scare youth ban. Can you tell us what happened? Yes, I had been playing uh, pool for... Um, uh, that pub in South Derbyshire for a number of months and um, this wasn't a local pub this wasn't a five minute walk around the corner this was a seven mile trip and I wasn't driving at that time so I had to get a lift there and uh, I'd been playing there for a number of months and um, I went there one Thursday night to play my match and I walked in the door and the, the pool team were all stood in a circle by the bar and as soon as I opened the door, he just looked at me and pointed at the door and said, you, get out. Um, and I just felt numb, empty, worthless. Um, and this wasn't a spur of the moment thing. This was done to humiliate me because these people had my phone number. And as I say, it wasn't a five-minute walk around the corner. These people could have phoned, one of them could have phoned me up and warned me. But they didn't. They wanted to publicly humiliate me. Um, but the crazy thing is about human beings is that bunch of people were there to put me down. But I got home. Uh, I can't remember if I was in tears or not. I, 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 I certainly felt low. I know that. But within half an hour of me being back at home, there was another public house which was 100, 200 yards down the road from that one phoned me up, they'd heard about what happened and they asked me to go and play pool for them. Somebody's there to kick you down and somebody's there to pick you up. You um, travelled to the States on and off. Um, what's your experience been of trying to get visas to travel there? Um, well, my oldest brother went to America in the early 90s and when he came back he had a picture of himself sat on the edge of the Grand Canyon. And I used to look at it and think, I want to go there. And um, I'd asked my cousin, 16-year-old cousin at the time, I said, do you fancy going to America? And he was big into air shows and things. And uh, we talked about going to San Diego and various places. So uh, in 1998, I thought, yeah, come on, let's go. And I asked at Oxford about going, and I said, how easy is it, is it to go there? And they said, well... If you want our advice, we suggest you're open about it and contact the American Embassy and tell them everything. So I 
filled in an application form for a visa and I put that I got a communicable disease and they refused me, point blank. And uh, I was deflated, but I thought, OK, let's per persevere with this, you know, because I've been open, I've been honest, and I kept asking and asking and asking. And eventually they gave me a two-month visa. Uh, so me and my cousin, we went, we had a week in San Diego, a week in Florida, and I drove from San Diego to the Grand Canyon, had my picture taken, great time. Um, no issues at all over there. Uh, I came back. And then a friend of mine asked me to be best man at his wedding. I thought, yeah, brilliant. Where is it? Florida. I went. And uh, I had to apply for another visa. And um, again, they refused me. And I said, you've already given me one. What are your grounds for refusing me? And eventually they gave me another visa. So I went over there for the wedding. And... Um, I came back and then I went again in 2001, uh, did a five-week trip, and that's when I had the kid came back and had the kidney problems because I wasn't drinking enough. Um, and then I went again in 2002, 2003, and the final time I went was 2004. But um, in 2003, um, I landed at Boston Logan Airport, and I was at immigration and. I handed my passport over and my visa was in the passport and the, the, the guy in the booth, he says, why have you got this visa? And I said, well, I've got a communicable disease. And I went, and, and before I could say anything else, he says, right, come with me. He closed his booth up and put me in a holding cell for an hour. Um, so I just sat there and I thought, okay, well, you know, there's no point in getting angry. It's not going to get you anywhere. Just let things settle down and uh, eventually this guy comes and gets me out and um, he says can we have a chat I said yep and uh, he says why have you been pulled in I said good question and um, I said well I'm HIV positive and I've put that on the document and he says well he was all apologetic and he said, look, all I can do is apologise. He says, I can't guarantee this won't happen again. He says, but you've got my sincere apologies. Um, I'll sign you in for six months. Go off and have a good holiday. Martin, in terms of your employment, you did a, a youth training scheme, 1987-1988. Yes. What, what happened there? Um, well, after I'd finished at the training centre in Leicester, um, when I came back to Burton, I started on a youth training scheme. Uh, I think it was Friday, December the 6th, 1985. Um, and uh, this was basically um, a two-year course doing electronics. And uh, during that period, uh, we were trained in all various aspects of electronics. And... Um, I remember, obviously, it was during this two-year period that I was told of my diagnosis. And um, I think it, this happened in probably sometime in 87. Um, I was talking to a lad who I was working with, and I mentioned that I was HIV positive. And um, one of the bosses overheard me, and he pulled me to one side, and he says, I think it would be a good idea if we informed everybody. I don't know why, but um, he, so he took, he took everybody into a conference room. And there was a couple of hundred people in there. And he just stood up and he basically told everybody. And he basically stood up in front of everybody and told them about my HIV status. Um, and I'm thinking, after, afterwards I was thinking, this guy probably knows less about it than I do, you know, and he, there he is telling everybody. I mean, th thankfully, I didn't receive any um, prejudice from the other colleagues, um, you know, and whether, whether they didn't have any full, full understanding of it, I don't know. You, you then went to, to work at a local electronics company mm -hmm. uh, and...
and you had a, an experience there again with one of the, yes. the members of the management. I finished the uh, youth training youth training scheme in January '88, and um, it was a month or two after that I, I started on a three month uh, placement at a company called Doing Electronics, and. Um, Basically, everybody sat at a desk and you, you've got to assemble circuit boards. Um, and the, the, the work crew were predominantly women. There was, uh, there was uh, one man next to me, um, a gay man next to me, and there was another man in the stores. Um, and the rest were all women. And uh, the days went by and there never seemed to be any issues. Um, we all got on with our work, you know, and that was it. And and then, after about two months, the bosses called me in, and they said um, the workforce isn't happy, and they've basically said either he goes or we go, and I was forced out. You've since that time. Uh, spent a, a significant portion of your time doing public speaking yes. various places across the country. What can you tell us about that? Um, that started in Janu in 1997, after I came out of the uh, John Waring Ward, um, started on the regime of pills, and I was on the road to recovery, as I call it. <clears throat> um, sometime that year, there was a clinical nurse specialist uh, who phoned me up and she'd got my details, I think from Derby Royal Infirmary. And uh, I think she was doing a dissertation or something. And she asked me if she could come and have a chat. So she came over and we talked about my experiences and things. And she said to me, said, would you be interested or would you talk to some medical students? Um, she worked for uh, Staffordshire Health Authority. And I said, yeah, okay. And um, so she arranged these um, meetings three or four times a year at various places around the country. And uh, I would go, I would tell them my experiences, and then I would do a Q&A session at the end. Um, this was all voluntary. And, uh, and then there was other, other people got to hear of it word of mouth, and I also did talks at um, a prison to the uh, prison, prisoners and the prison staff. Um, and then uh, a few of the doctors at Oxford heard about it, so I got invited to do talks at Oxford University and the John Ratcliffe Hospital and, and Cardiff University. Um, basically, my attitude has been, it's happened to me, it shouldn't have done, but if people can learn from me, then fine. And I did that for the next 22 years. And you're now involved, or you were at the time you prepared your statement for the inquiry, with a review of quality standards in yes. hospitals. Yes, yes. Um, I got uh, invited to join the uh, West Midlands Quality Review Group last year. Um, and this basically involves going around haemophilia centres, um, seeing where they can be improved um, and uh, seeing what things they need to be pu pulled up on. Um, and uh, my f the first one I did was at Derby Royal Infirmary, which was a, it was an eye opener because uh, it's it's good to see how well the place is run and um, the staff there are superb, I have to say, uh, but they are under a lot of pressure. Martin, you've made applications to the McFarling Trust. Yes. Um, over the years, you've said you didn't find the form-filling problematic, but having to trace your medical records and provide the required documentation to the McFarland Trust was where you had some difficulties. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, when I, when I got my medical records from Birmingham, um, considering they had 17 years worth of my notes, they were the, the most helpful out of everybody. Um, they sent me 17 years worth of notes and I, I, they never charged me a penny for them or anything, it was easy um, but uh, other places um, I've, I've struggled to get hold of records uh, and uh, although you have as you've said a number of records 
you haven't been able to locate in those records a copy of whatever letter it was that Birmingham Children's Hospital sent yeah. to Leicester, which elicited that October 1985 yeah. letter that we looked at earlier. Well, when, when I got hold of those records in 2006, um, when they all came in the po through the post, big boxes, curiosity, I started looking through them, and I found that letter from 85, um, where it was being withheld from me. And I thought, well, I'm going to make a copy of that. And I made a copy of a few others, and then I put them all in the box. I thought, I don't want to read any more. And I sent them away to the uh, solicitors in Preston, and this was all to do with the US litigation. And um, one of the forms, I actually ticked that I would like a copy of these notes back. And um, I think I got, them, I got the copies back a couple of years later or something like that. And lo and behold, the original of that 1985 letter is missing. And those notes have been through three different solicitors. We have the copy because you had made a copy of it. Yes. But you don't have very much else from the 1980s in terms no. of records. No. Martin, those are the questions I had for you. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Um... There's many, there's many sad things about this entire scandal. Um, it's not just the loss of life and the destruction of communities that this has caused and the pain on people. People are accountable. Um, I'm not going to sit here and bash doctors because I don't believe that all doctors go into the profession to hurt people. They make mistakes along the way. They're human beings. Um, they lose track sometimes of what they were there for. But this goes higher up than that. There are MPs that are accountable and they should be made to answer. And I believe now is the time for justice. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Sir? There's just, just one... Thing that I, I want to ask you about. When, after 1997, for the next 20 odd years, you, you went around talking to medical students, the, the doctors of tomorrow, you gave them your presentation and then you say there were question and answer sessions. Uh, I just wonder if there was any general theme that you picked up of interest from the questions that these future doctors were asking you. One of the main questions was, do I believe that attitudes have changed? And on the whole, they have. Um, there's still stigma out there, especially in the small communities. I've met haemophiliacs over the years that live in small communities that are too afraid or too scared to speak out about what's happened to them because of the um, possible repercussions. Um, the town I live in is not a massive town, but it's, uh, it's bigger than most. Um, and I've always tried to encourage people to ask me questions and be open. And, you know, I, I don't want people walking away from me thinking, I wish I'd asked him that, I wish I'd asked him this. You know, take the opportunity. Um, but one thing that does sadden me and I, I had this conversation with my HRV consultant yesterday. I said to them, I said, how long have you been in the medical profession? And he says to me, he says, oh, a long time. I said, no, how long? He says, in 1993. I said, so really, you're still a newcomer. <laughs> and I said, you weren't around when all this kicked off. He says, no. And I says, I'll tell you what saddens me. When I get doctors that have only been in the game 10, 20 years, apologizing to me and a lot of them do and they're red-faced and they apologize and it, it saddens me that they feel they have to apologize for the mistakes that their predecessors have made thank you, thank you. Well, martin thank you very much indeed for that um thank you for being here and sharing your experiences with us no problem Thank you. Well, we'll
take a break now till five past twelve. At five past twelve, uh, who do we have? We'll be hearing from David Gore. Thank you. Five past twelve.